Welcome. These videos were recorded while I taught econometrics over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, the questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. That explains why you may notice some unnatural transitions and why the videos are shorter than a normal lecture. But hopefully you enjoyed them anyway. Bye now. Let's start our lecture number 10. Today we're going to talk about RDD, which stands for Regression Discontinuity Design, and Matching Estimators. So to recap, um, last class, which happened before the midterm, uh, we talk about non-parametric estimation of conditional expectations. Uh, we talk about non-parametric regression generally, and we discuss the Q nearest neighbors estimator, the Naira Watson estimator, and the local linear regression estimator. And these were all non-parametric methods um, to estimate something like the Spakti value of Y condition on X. Today, we're going to move to a very popular design in economics and other social sciences, known as the regression discontinuity design. And we're going to see that um, once you understand what this is about and how this recovers a certain type of causal effect, that at the end of the day, in terms when it comes to estimation, this approach is just going to rely on these estimators that we discuss over here. When you think about the so-called evaluation methods in economics, and again, uh, maybe broadly in social sciences, um, is the idea that you want to recover some form of like counterfactual. And by counterfactual, I mean some form of policy effect, treatment effect that we call. And you can phrase this in terms of these potential outcomes that we've been using so far. And if, if you think about, there are essentially five approaches uh, that um, are dominant when it comes to this. One is just the use of experiments, which are popular, say, in development, and we talked about it a little bit. And just by virtue of being able to assign randomly people to treatment and control, you can answer questions about kind of factuals. The other things are the so-called natural experiments, okay, which is related to difference in difference. Something happens state at a given time, for example, and then you start comparing you know, places that were subject to this exogenous change, to places that were not subject to this change, and then you have another approach. We talked a bit uh, about that. Um, the third one is just IV broadly defined, which include things like late, and in particular, marginal treatment effects, which I haven't covered and I will not cover in this class. But if we just go to linear regressions with constant effects, it's just two stage least squares, IV, and this stuff that uh, we discussed. And then the last two are matching in methods and discontinuity designs, which are the two that we're going to talk today. I repeat because I want to be clear about the scopes of this. This is not intended as a one lecture. Let's talk about these two, and then there's everything you need to know about these two. Uh, to give you a sense, in Econ 481, uh, which is the second year class, um, we're devoting the next two or three weeks to RDD. Okay. So there are places where you can know more details. And here I want you to get exposed to know what the main things are and be able to guide you to what are the basics in case you don't um, take you know, second year courses on these topics. All right, let's get started. So the general notation we're gonna use is we're gonna have potential outcomes. It's gonna be the usual Y1, Y0, nothing different about this. Uh, we're gonna have a treatment assignment that I'm gonna denote by D as I've done before. It's going to be binary, D1 being treated, D0 not treated. And then uh, the parameter of interest um, could be some of the ones that we uh, covered so far. We know, for example, the difference between Y1 and Y0 is called the treatment effect. And then, you know, some of the summaries of this heterogeneous treatment effect could be the expected value of the difference, which is known as the average treatment effect. The expected value of the difference conditional on the equal to one, which is the average treatment on the treated. And there are others that we discussed, like the local average treatment effect. Um, the problem in general, when it comes to identification of counterfactuals, is that for each unit, we only observe either Y1 if they're treated or Y0 if they're not treated. And today we're going to try to find a design that is going to help us identify a feature of this treatment effect in a particular setting. What are the RDD basics? Um, the Regression discontinuity, or RD, design um, is defined by a triplet, okay? And whenever you talk about this, there are the first three things that you need to identify. 
One is there a score or sometimes referred to as a running variable. Then there's a cutoff, okay, that is gonna determine uh, whether the score is above or below and something will happen uh, if that's the case. And then there's gonna be a treatment. And of course there are gonna be outcomes, okay? But in particular, you need to know what's the score, what's the cutoff, what's the treatment. Units will receive a score, okay? For the example that I'm gonna use to have in mind is that you have an SIT score, okay? Which is a standardized test you take to get into college in the US. And so a treatment could be that if you do sufficiently well, for example, you have a cutoff that is known. If you get a score that is above 2100, then you get a scholarship and that would be the treatment. And so RDD becomes this like easy way of representing the treatment, which is you get assigned to treatment if you do sufficiently well in your score on your running variable. So in this case, you get a scholarship if you get a score above 2100. So I wrote here, the treatment or scholarship is given to units whose score is above the cutoff, say 2100, and is not given to units that are below the cutoff. So if you didn't do sufficiently well. Exploiting this um, change is a discontinuous change in the odds that you get the treatment is what we're gonna try to exploit in this design to identify something about the treatment effect. So to be more specific about the notation, I'm gonna denote the score or running variable by the letter Z. And it's gonna be a scalar, okay? This is by far the most standard case in RDD, not the only one. We're gonna discuss cases where Z could be in R2 uh, later, for example. Um, there's gonna be a cutoff, which is a constant known, and it is um, one of the this constant by the letter C. So we're not gonna normalize the cutoff to zero for most of the discussion, because it simplifies the expressions, but this is without loss of generality. You can always subtract the cutoff from Z, and then it's just gonna be the case that the cutoff is zero, okay? Um, the treatment assignment, in the so-called sharp RDD, I'm gonna tell why sharp later, but this is, let's call it standard IDD. It's gonna be, you get assigned to treatment when your score is above the threshold, which in this case is normalized to zero. And the observed outcome is just gonna be Y zero for those that are treated, that is for those that have the score below the threshold, and it's gonna be Y one for those, sorry, this is the untreated, and it's gonna be equal to Y one for those that are treated, those that are above the threshold. And so when you compute the expected value of y conditional on the running variable, well, you see that it is the expected value of y zero conditional on z when z is below the threshold and it is the expected value of y one conditional on z when z is above the threshold. So the idea is to exploit this discontinuity, the fact that the conditional expectation we can compute, which is this one over here, this is identified in the data is at a, given point, which in this case is the cutoff, which is zero, is um, changes from a conditional expectation of Y zero to a conditional expectation of Y one. You can of course uh, describe this um, mathematically, um, but let's start doing this in a picture. So here I'm plotting the expected value of uh, y a, a being zero or one, doesn't matter, the potential outcomes condition on z. And so here, for example, you have the expected value of y one condition on z. Here we have z, here we have the condition expectations. And here we have another condition expectation, the condition expectation of the random variable y zero. So if you look at the distance between the orange and the blue line vertical at a given point in z, we have the difference between expected value of y one and y zero for that particular z. Okay, and the average treatment effect would be to integrate all this over Z, right? That will give us the average treatment effect. But the problem here is that when you are to the left of the cutoff, which I call here control units, you only get to identify the expected value of Y0 given Z. There's no data on this line over here, right? You don't have anybody that has Y1s for those that are control units. And when you're on the other side, you have you can identify the expected value of y1 condition on z, but you have no information about those uh, units that have say y0 because everybody's treated. Everybody's treated above, everybody's treated below. So what happens then 
is that something special happens at zero. Because at zero, you can compare the difference between the two lines uh, intuitively. And so this is the parameter that RDD is going to identify. It's going to identify the expected value of y1 minus y0, conditional on the running variable being exactly equal to the cutoff. Okay. And that's the intuition behind RDD. So a row here, a special situation occurs at the cutoff z equal to zero is the only point at which we may almost uh, observe both curves. So consider two groups of units here. Those that have scale exactly equal to zero, well, that's fine. Those are treated units. And let's assume that you observe a lot of people with z i equal to zero, then you can use those to compute the expected value of y condition and z equal to zero. Now, you don't observe those that are uh, at zero that are untreated, but you know, think about those that are just barely below the threshold. Let's call them here z equals the negative epsilon. Okay. Well, negative epsilon will give you control units. And so now, you know, I wrote here if the values of the expected value of y zero condition on z being equal to negative epsilon are not abruptly different from those of this expectation when z is equal to zero, then units with z equal to negative epsilon are so-called a valid counterfactual to units that are z equal to zero. And that's exactly what RDD does. RDD says the parameter of interest, which we call theta, is the expected value of y1 minus y0 condition on z equal to zero. And you can write this as the expected value of y1 conditional on z equal to zero, which is just the expected value of y conditional on z equal to zero, minus the expected value of y zero conditional on z equal to zero, which you can write as the limit of the expected value of y conditional on z approaching from the left. Okay. So the requirement here, and is there one assumption essentially behind RDD, is that actually both conditional expectations are continuous at zero. And this, in this description. We only need the expected value of y0 condition um, continuous at the cutoff. So RDD exploits continuity in these conditional expectations, which if you go back to the pictures, it's saying this, this functions over here must be continuous so that whenever you find a jump, you can attribute the jump to differences in these functions as opposed to a discontinuity in the functions, right? And in particular, you want to be using units that are close here to um, say something about this point. Okay. So the RDD parameter, which I'm going to call theta SRD, and the S stands for sharp, which uh, we're going to contrast later with something called fuzzy, um, is this the expected value of y1 minus y0 at zero. So is the expected average tr is treatment effect for those units at the cutoff. I wrote here, it is local because theta uh, SRD is a local average treatment effect, like the late parameter discussed under IB, but it's not necessarily the same parameter. Of course not. So, um, um, but it has the same flavor. The trick is that RDD uses this continuous dependence on the treatment on the running variable to identify a local average treatment effect, okay? And essentially you're exploiting this. The probability of getting a sign conditional on Z is this continuous at Z. <clears throat> so in the so-called sharp design, there is so-called perfect compliance. Every unit above the threshold receives the treatment. Every unit below the threshold is a control unit. And so if you do sufficiently well in the SIT exam, as we said before, you get the scholarship. And then if you don't, you do not get the scholarship. So if you write this probability of getting the treatment or the scholarship condition on your running variable or the SIT score, then that's going to be zero if you're below this threshold. And it's one if you're above the threshold. In the so-called fuzzy R design, which we're going to discuss later, there's imperfect compliance, and these two numbers are not going to be 0 and 1. 
but there are going to be the number, whatever number is here is going to be higher than the number over here. Okay. And so this is going to introduce other issues. Uh, but, you know, um, arguably, uh, when people, you know, talk about RDD, they always are thinking essentially about the sharp design. Although the fussy design could be equally popular because there are a lot of settings where that will happen. But as I said, we're going to discuss that later. For now, let's stick to this situation where we just go from zero to one. Questions about what I said so far? Let's keep moving. Estimation, sharp RDD, non-parametric estimators of the expected value of y given z and the limits um, actually could be constructed using uh, data to the right and to the left of zero, right? The problem is that we have a boundary issue because we're estimating these condition expectations with observations only to one side of the point. Okay, so when we try to estimate the conditional expectation of the limit from the left, we're just going to be using observations from the left of zero. And when we try to estimate the other object, which is the um, limit from the right, we're just going to be using observations from the right of zero, as opposed to what we did last class, where for a given point, we use observations that are on both sides. So as um, equivalently, you're saying you're estimating something at the boundary. And we learned last class that local linear estimators have better properties at the boundary than kernel estimators. In particular, the bias of the local linear estimator was of order h squared. Remember that h is going to zero, so h squared is small, relative to h, which is the boundary of the Nada Watson estimator. So for this reason, um, you will see that as you start looking at applications of RDD and, you know, packages in Stata and R, things like that, that they were are mostly based on uh, local linear estimators. And precisely for this reason, because local linear estimators perform better or have better performance when you estimate things at the boundary, and RDD is exactly about estimating things at the boundary. So local linear regression, as I wrote here, especially easy in this case, you only care about estimation at the cutoff. So you're not estimating a function at different points. You just estimate a function at a given point. And so um, what we do is, is you can, as I wrote here, compute um, kernel weights based on this point and then run weighted least uh, squares regression on observations either above or below um, zero. If you think about the easy case of a uniform kernel, local linear regression is the same as two unweighted linear regressions on observations on the right and on the left, okay, given your neighborhood, meaning negative h, zero, and zero to h. So uh, in terms of estimation, this doesn't bring anything new. Like if you say you consider yourself an expert or estimating non-parametric regressions at the boundary, nothing new about RTD, nothing different. It's just two regressions like that, OK? So let me show you um, how it looks in terms of formulas. So how would you estimate the expected value of y condition z equals zero? Or then you run this regression here. Remember, importantly, I'm going to provide general expressions later when we get to fuzzy. But now notice that z is zero. And so local linear regression is just weighted using these kernels, okay, and using observations from the right, in this case, of a regression of y on z. That's what you're doing and then you collect the intercept. And then when you want the other one, the one from the left, you run the same thing, but with an indicator here using observations on the from the left. Look, the only difference between this regression and this regression is these two indicators. So you do a regression from the right and a regression from the left. You compute the difference of these two and then you have an estimator of the RDD parameter, which is non-parametric. Let's look how this look graphically. Um, I borrowed this uh, pictures uh, from a friend that gave it to me. So um, the notation is not exactly the same. I probably should redo these pictures, um, but Z here is X. So in this picture, X is the running variable, the score. 
D is W. So W is the treatment. And then my intercept here is called alpha. Okay. So um, having this notation in mind, you have the expected value of Y1 condition on the score, the expected value of Y0 condition on the score. And what you want on this, like, you know, points, which I'm calling here alpha one minus alpha zero, that will be the treatment effect uh, at the cutoff. So now think about data. You only observe data from uh, the red part to the right. You only observe data from the blue part on the left. And that's the data that you get to observe. And we're going to use this data to estimate this alpha one and alpha zero business. What do we do? Well, we need to um, uh, remove the lines. So now you can see how data and RDD typically looks like. Like when you plot it, um, you know, you will often th see something like this, which, you know, at least visually quite often, you're going to be able to detect uh, the uh, discontinuity at the point. Not all the time, but quite often. So then you choose a bandwidth. And when you choose a bandwidth, essentially, you're just saying, I want to use the observations that fall within the bandwidth, okay? Outside the bandwidth, which are the gray area, these are useless for your estimation purposes. For everything in RDD, observations outside the bandwidth are not used at all, okay? So we're going to set the bandwidth, and we're going to say, um, I'm going to use these red observations to estimate alpha 1. I want to use these blue observations to estimate alpha 0. And so what you do is you run a linear regression. Say, for example, you run a linear regression on the observations on the right, okay? They're weighted, perhaps, by this kernel. And then you collect the intercept, which is this alpha hat 1. And then you're going to do the same from the left. You know, run a linear regression, you get an intercept, and then you call that alpha hat 0. The difference between alpha hat 1 and alpha hat 0 is our estimator of the RDD effect, or SRD, as we call it before. Then you can just come back and plot the actual uh, expectations, and then you see how this works, OK? So of course, they're not exactly the same in the simulation, but um, you know they're roughly close. This is how RDD works. If you understand the mechanics behind this picture, then of course, you understand uh, what's going on behind RDD. The rest of the important details behind RDD have more to do with understanding non-parametric regression and the properties of local linear estimators and how to choose the bandwidth and the like than anything that goes um, outside uh, this picture, OK? I'm not saying that those don't matter. I'm going to talk about it. But um, in terms of what you're doing and what are the main driving force from identification estimation is explained very well in, in these four pictures. So what's the most important choice when it comes to doing RDD? And this is a general statement as when you're, you know, to when you're doing like non-parametrics in general, well, is how to choose the bandwidth. That's the main thing. Okay, we talked about this when we talk about Naya Watson and local linear estimation. And then we saw that, you know, there, you know, for example, choosing the kernel and so on wasn't that relevant for the finite sample performance of the estimators, but choosing the bandwidth could severely affect, um, choosing different bandwidth um, could severely affect how um, performance changes. So the key idea here is the same as before. If you use a large bandwidth, then you're going to have more bias because you're using observations that are farther away from the point that you really care about. And those observations may be not as quote unquote good because you're using observations that are far. So you really need your function to be really smooth or flat or linear, depending on what you're using to for this to work well. At the same time, when you the bandwidth is larger, you have smaller variance because you're using more observations. You increase the bandwidth, you have more observations that are usable. And so now, well, then the variance goes down. And so you have this trade-off. It's exactly the same trade-off we discussed at last class. And so when you talk about bandwidth selection, quite commonly, even though it's not the only way of doing this, people will just frame things in terms of mean squared error, okay? The square of the bias plus the variance. Let's try to minimize that. So 
this paper by Emmons and Kalyan Araman. Um, is a RISTA paper in 2012, does exactly this. Derives the optimal uh, uh, bandwidth by minimizing mean square error. As I said, the bandwidth is a function typically on a, of a constant. We, we saw what this constant sort of like was last class, it may depend on the densities and derivatives of the function and so on, times a uh, rate that is n to the negative one phi. And in this paper, they, taught, they define or they explain how to estimate this constant. So C hat IK is just um, an estimator of that constant. And then, you know, as I said, uh, as of today, for pretty much everything that I'm saying, you don't need to go and recode anything. It's all these package, uh, packages are coded and as in, in, in R, Stata, and probably other languages by now. And so then, you know, um, you don't really need to know exactly what C hat is. You need to know what paper you're following to compute your bandwidth. So later on, paper by Kalonico, Catania, and Titunic, okay, it was an econometrical paper, made some improvements over this IK bandwidth. So they propo propose a different estimator, which I want to call here C hat CCT. But this, uh, at least from my point of view, is not the main innovation of the paper. The main point of the paper was that they um, took into account that there was um, bias, um, correction, okay? Meaning they took into account that the estimator is biased. Remember the difference between doing under smoothing and killing the bias of these non-parametric estimators or just saying, okay, I have a bias and I may need to estimate the bias. Well, this paper says, you know, we're gonna estimate the bias, but when you estimate the bias, you are adding additional noise to your estimator. So that affects the asymptotic variance, though they have a new variance estimator. So this paper by Colonico, Catania, and Titunic, okay, essentially has three things, a way to choose the bandwidth, a way to estimate the bias, and a way to estimate standard errors that account for the fact that you're estimating the bias. And, you know, as of today, um, this paper became more and more and more popular. You'll see it in applied papers, more recent applied papers in RDD uh, really often. Plus, uh, Matias Catania and, and Rocio Titunic and, um, and Calonico, they, they are a team of people who have written uh, a lot of different papers on RDD, and they have developed tons of data packages and R packages for doing all this. So as I said, you don't need to code anything. These packages are very thorough and complete. So even though I'm going to say this is the approach that I would recommend you do, and there are new things going on every day on RDD. Last Tuesday, okay, two days ago, we actually had a seminar on um, RDD that was proposing yet a different approach to do this that, of course, I can cover today because it was based on different tools. But I'm saying this is still an area of research where people are coming up with new ways of doing um, inference and so on. And it probably gets a lot of attention because of the simple reason that, as I said, in social sciences generally, and in economics in particular, there are a lot of settings with this type of discontinuities arise, okay? And so, you know, the number of situations when you look at something and you say like, oh, this fits into RDD is really large. So uh, therefore, a lot of applied papers, therefore, a lot of theory papers trying to improve upon uh, the methods that we know. It's still common today to see papers using under smoothing, meaning you do RDD and you ignore the fact that you may have a bias and so on. Um, I think at this point, it doesn't make any sense to do that because it is equally easy to do something like I'm calling here CCT approach. And then, you know, um, it's something that is known to perform better in finite samples. Okay. So again, you could devote an entire lecture on this. And this is something I want to clarify. We can go into the details. We can talk about what is this C hat? What is this C? What is the difference between this C hat and this C hat IK? You know, how does the, how, why is it important to correct for the bias? And what's the new variance formula? Why is this variance formula different from the one that doesn't take into account that you're estimating the bias? Sure, that is interesting, but definitely beyond the scope that I want to say. And if you're just somebody who wants to use these things, I would recommend that, you know, at this point, and especially when you move to second year, third year students, you're better off just going to uh, and read some of these papers. These are not by any means difficult papers to read if you have the right background. And I'm hoping that today's class gives you sufficient of a background for you tomorrow uh, uh, are working on RDD and say like, oh, I remember this is a good paper. 
I just need to go and read it. Okay. And that's, that's what I would recommend. All right. So look at this picture. Here we have two bandwidth. Okay. H2, H1, H1, H2. And so the point is when you have a small bandwidth, or let's start with a large bandwidth, you use more observations. Okay. But then when you estimate your slope, if, if data is coming from here, you know, say the, this, the regression is going to look like this. So here, actually, the slope is positive. We don't care about the slope. We care about the intercept is this point, right? And then here, use a large bandwidth, and this is my estimator of the slope, right? But then if you use a smaller bandwidth, use fewer observations, okay? But then you get something that is uh, hopefully closer, has lower bias at that point. But you're just going to have a higher variance because we're going to be using closer observations. So if you repeat this, it may oscillate more. And so this is the trade-off that you can see in a case um, that illustrates the difference between using a large bandwidth and a small bandwidth. So the choice of bandwidth, in particular, if the functions are weakly, and as in this case, they're nonlinear, okay? So you use few observations, you're estimating over here, you start using more, and then you're getting observations over here. You see observations over here, you know, are very different than observations over here. And so the idea of RDD is to use, and non-parametric regression in general, is to use observations that contain information similar to the ones uh, of the point that you care about. Do we have questions about what we discussed so far? Let's go. Other RD designs. So as I said, this what we discussed so far is a sharp RD. There's something called fuzzy RD. I'm gonna discuss next. Okay. Um, so I said fuzzy RD is when this probability of assignment is discontinuous at the cutoff, but not necessarily going from zero to one. So some units above C may decide not to get the treatment. So that's why you would say there's non-compliance. You know, one example is voting eligibility at 18, or any situation in which after sorry, any situation after you cross a threshold allows you to get the treatment, but doesn't force, us, uh, doesn't force you to take the treatment. So uh, after 18, you may vote, and you cannot vote below 18, but you may decide not to vote after 18. So you go from zero to some positive probability because people certainly vote, but not one. Then there are like other features that I'm not gonna discuss in this class at all, but I just wanna run by you. One is kink RDD. So now, you're don't uh, use a discontinuity in the function, but you use discontinuities in the derivatives, okay, of the function. So kinks RDD is all about kinks. It's all about situations where you have a function, you know, that goes like this, and then goes like this, and, and something like that. And so you're gonna be using a discontinuity in the derivative, as opposed to a discontinuity in the level. Other than this and the complications uh, that come from that, it is conceptually the same. And then there are uh, more general cases of the one that we have discussed. Uh, for example, one where there are like multiple scores. Sometimes you know there are different um, um, scores that you need to take. You know, math and English, for example. And in order to get a fellowship, you need a certain minimum in math and English. Okay, so then you start plotting this in R two. Another one that happens uh, often in R2 is uh, geographic RDD. You live in a neighborhood, and then, you know, at, at some point, you may live at the boundary, as I do. I live at the boundary of Evanston and Wilmette across the street. It's Wilmette. So this is the boundary of Evanston. And so sometimes people will use boundaries, geographic boundaries, to measure discontinuities. But, you know, a geographic boundary is something you determine in R2. Um, and there could be multiple cutoffs as well. So sometimes it's not only happens at a given point, there are multiple points, and then you can imagine. And then for any of these generalizations, there are papers that will show you how to do this. Um, and as I said, we're not going to cover any of this in this class, okay? But they exist. I just want you to be aware of. The one that, that I do want to do, uh, devote some attention to is the fuzzy RD. Um, so we're going to talk about that next. So um, as I said, imperfect compliance happens when you qualify to receive the treatment uh, above the threshold, but you are not forced to take the treatment. 
So the probability of receiving the treatment changes at C, okay? Sometimes go from zero to something. Sometimes go as positive on both sides, but not necessarily from zero to one. Some units with score above C may decide not to take up the treatment. And sometimes it happens that units below C manage to get the treatment from some other in some other way. So some people actually have the treatment below Z. But here, for example, in, in the case that I'm saying is Z is a test score and D is the scholarship, exactly the same as before. But having a score larger than C makes the application strong, but does not guarantee a scholarship. So this is a case that is not even a choice, right? But, you know, it's not only the scholarship that will give you, uh, sorry, the test score that will give you a scholarship. There may be other factors and then you don't know. There's a decision admissions committee or decisions committee that will decide whether you get the scholarship or not. And so in that case, um, suppose that this is a necessary condition, then everybody above the cutoff is eligible to the, receive the scholarship, uh, but may not get the scholarship. So if this is the case, and I'm trying to say that this situation over here actually happens quite a lot as well, this, um, it is no longer possible to identify the parameter that we identified earlier, but this allows for identification of another local treatment effect. And the argument is very similar to late, okay? But, you know, it's also mixed with all these limits that are always present in RDD. So the parameter that you can identify, which is called theta FRD for fuzzy RDD, is the expected value of Y1 conditional on Z equal to C, minus the expected value of Y0 conditional on Z equal to C, divided by the expected value of D1, Remember the potential treatments that we've been using so far, condition Z equal to C, minus expected value of D10, uh, DI0, sorry, condition Z equal to C. And then you rewrite this as limits from the right and to the left, and this is what you obtain. So now no, notice that again, since you know how to do non-parametric regression, this involves estimating this, 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 and this. So fuzzy RDD involves running four local linear regressions, okay? Each gives you um, one of these components. So it's the average treatment effect for units that are at the threshold, this is the regression discontinuity design, but only for those that decide to change their D given uh, that they are at the threshold. And we used to call those people compliers, okay? And this is the sense in which this is like late. Hopefully that's clear then. And um, let's continue. So, fuzzy RD requires four local linear regressions, as I said, which are the four elements in the formula that I said before. And then here are the four regressions. Uh, notice that two of these regressions have data above the threshold, two of these regressions have data below the threshold, okay? And then two of these regressions have the outcome as uh, run as a, um, the independent variable, and then the other two have D. Other than that, they're exactly the same. Then you collect the intercepts of these four regressions, and then you have the parameter that we can identify. <clears throat> Notice how this is also a bit of reverse engineering, again, which I said about late at the time, which is not about, this is not a setting where you say, okay, this is the parameter that I want, and uh, let's see how this helps me. It's a setting where like, okay, this is the design, this is the data, that I'm uh, getting, and this is the structure of this data, what can I say with this data? And then the method tells you, well, you can say something about theta hat FRD. And so the point is, you know, sometimes this could be um, interesting, and sometimes it won't be interesting. So one last thing I'm gonna say about FOSI RDD is that and, and there are more um, results kind of like that. If you define T, which is similar, is what I defined before as the intention to treat, okay? It's whether you're above or below 
Um, it's just an indicator, it's binary. Then T is a valid instrument for D, okay? Because conditional on Z, T is exogenous. Of course, conditional on Z, T is not even random, okay? It's just a deterministic uh, object. So you can estimate FOSI RD instead of computing the four local linear regressions that I said before as two stage least squares, okay? And this is often done. So the local linear approach with uniform kernel and same bandwidth is numerically equivalent to two stage least squares of this regression. Of course, this nice ana analogy holds just for the case of the uniform kernel and same bandwidth in each of these four regressions. Um, but take that as given, then you can obtain the theta uh, fuzzy RD parameter as the coefficient multiplying D in a regression of Y on D, Z minus Z, and the interaction between T and Z minus Z using T as excluded instrument. And then of course, using just data in the bandwidth from the right and from the left. And then, you know, there are manipulations that show you that this is equivalent to the stuff that we said before. So you're going to see that sometimes um, people may do things like that. Um, I don't think that mechanically uh, all these packages that are around will do something like this. It is uh, most likely doing something like the one, um, the description in this slide. But there's the analogy. So two more things before we move on. Um, the validity of RDD uh, depends on this continuity assumption that we discussed before. So I wrote here, RD imposes relatively weak assumptions. If you just think about assumptions, we assume that the continuity of these conditional expectations of the potential outcomes as a function of the running variable, okay? So people love the fact that RD you know, just works under weak assumptions. At the same time, our here is also, it identifies a very specific and local parameter. So assumptions are very weak, but also what it gives you in a way, sometimes is also very weak because you identify something very specific, which doesn't mean it is not an important object in some applications, it could be, but I'm just saying. For example, this is very cute, it has weak assumptions, you cannot say anything about the average treatment effect, right? So identification follows from this continuity condition, but a problem is that this continuity condition is fundamentally untestable. So when people want to see if more or less, you know, if the setting is right for RDD, well, RDD depends um, on something that you cannot test. So people started thinking or worrying about the following situation, okay? Consider a running variable that is the test score. And suppose that individuals know the threshold. So you know that to get the scholarship, you need 2,100. And you have the option of retaking the test. So if you think that you go and take the test and instead of getting 2,100, you got 2,083, then you may say like, oh, I was so close. Then you take it again. Okay. And then you take it again um, and um, say the next time you get 2,100. If you took the test and you got, I don't know, 1800s, you said, well, I'm so far, I'm not gonna even bother. But you can tell stories like that. And if it is the case then that this variable Z can be chosen by individuals, and in particular, it's around the cutoff, okay? You can just work harder to be to the right of the cutoff, okay? Then this is gonna create a discontinuity in the distribution of these random variables. Essentially, you're not gonna see anybody with a score of you know, 2,099. Because if you get 2,099, you say like, oh, I was unlucky, just take it again. I get 2,100 and then I get the scholarship. So this leads to a discontinuity of the density of the running variable at C. And the concern is that this possibly leads to a discontinuity of this condition expectation. And why is that? Because the condition expectation is the integral, okay, of Y times the conditional density and the conditional density is a ratio between the joint density and the density of C, okay? Here we are. And so the idea is that then if you're like this continuous here, then you are this continuous here. And if you are this continuous here, then you are this continuous there. You know, this is not an if and only if statement. It's certainly possible 
that, you know, this density is discontinuous and this entire thing is just continuous for whatever reason. Or it could be that, you know, um, some other story, but it's certainly a concern. And this problem is called manipulation of the running variable. Okay, so if you ever hear about the word manipulation, means that units, okay, can, um, you know, change the value of Z at will, at least even if it's not perfect. Um, and this may introduce issues. And it was this, described in this paper by McCrary in 2008, which also proposed a test for this discontinuity that is called McCrary's test. Now, there's another way of being concerned about RDD, which uh, takes the story as follows. Suppose that now you think that these potential outcomes, think about a model. So potential outcomes are generated by some function of the running variable, some other stuff, you know, let's call it X, and some unobserved U, okay? So, so far in RDD, remember we just use the outcomes and the running variable, which is scalar, but there could be other variables floating around, right? So think about this test score, the scholarship, there could be like, you know, parental income of the students, uh, how they did in, in, in high school, their GPAs, their gender, uh, race, uh, a lot of things, okay? Other X's that are not part of the discussion that we're having. And suppose that the distribution of X is discontinuous at Z equal to zero, okay? So then in that case, then uh, that could be a problem, okay? Because it could be that um, the effect, that, the discontinuity that you're using that you think is coming from the fact of the scholarship is actually capturing some other effect. Suppose that only kids that come from really high income families are the ones that perform really well in the SIT. Okay, so you look at the distribution of income and you see that people that are above 2,100, people with high income, okay, and people are just below 2,100, are people with lower income. So then you have a discontinuity in the distribution of X. And so now when you say, oh, I'm capturing the effect of the scholarship, in reality, you're capturing the effect of the income of their family, okay, which affects the future. And that's a concern. So. The idea is that the discontinuity of X at zero may affect the outcome, and these effects may be attributed to the treatment effect of interest. So what's a common practice? People will just test the null hypothesis, or will just report in tables, okay? Means of this covariance at the threshold. These condition expectations, notice, you know how to estimate this. Again, you can do local linear regression, you estimate those. And then people present those, and say so like, oh, look, um, you know, the means to the right and to the left of income and distribution of gender and all this look roughly the same. And so I'm not concerned about this issue. And if you reject, then there is a reason to be concerned because then it could be that this expectation is now discontinuous, okay? In other words, what I wrote here is that the discontinuity in X may confound the treatment effect. So, one important thing is that all the intuition that I said, and this is what I wrote this in blue, is about the entire distribution of X, not only about the mean. Whereas you will see that the standard practice in a lot of papers is just to report means. And, you know, in a paper that I wrote with one of my former students, uh, we claimed that that was unnecessarily the case because presumably early on, it was done that, like this because people knew how to compute these expectations at the boundary, and so they did this. Uh, but in this paper, we show how you can actually do something similar, testing like this, but just about the entire distribution of X from the right and from the left, okay? Which is what the intuition talks about. It's about the distribution of X, not about the mean. The means could be the same, but suppose that the variances are differences or any other moments are different. Well, that would be a concern that is not gonna be captured by something like this. So if you put everything together, there are two um, tests that are routinely done in RDD, and you're gonna see in papers in the appendix or whatever that are sometimes called placebo test, robustness test, that are the manipulation tests, where people look at the how's the behavior of the density at the point. Uh, you know, the most popular test by far is this test by McCrary, okay? Uh, that test the continuity of the density at the cutoff. Okay, the problem or an issue with this test by McCready is that it uses 
uh, or it assumes a lot of smoothness on the density function. You need like three bounded derivatives and blah, blah, blah. So it was to be a really nice density. Uh, recently, I proposed in a paper with Federico Bugni a test that doesn't uh, require smoothness. It's very easy to implement and it's based on order statistics. Um, I'm not um, telling you how to implement either of these tests, but I'm telling you that uh, this can be done and there are packages for you to do this. Then when you think about the continuity of covariates, as I said, you know, you, people sometimes estimate the means, but we uh, propose this test for the continuity of the conditional distribution of X given uh, Z and it's implemented uh, using permutation tests, which is something that we're going to discuss in the last lecture of this class. Um, so, and as I said, you have packages. Here I put this slide. There's nothing to comment on, but it's just for, so for you to have the links, okay? So the first link is this website by Matias Catania, where he compiles all the packages that he has. Here I wrote like a couple, RD robust, RD density. There are packages to do plots and stuff. They're both in R and Stata. It's a huge collection of things that allow you to do everything you want about RD. They're free, of course. You go download, you do RD. And then about the stuff that are related to permutation tests and uh, order statistics that I mentioned, you know, I have those in, in my website. You can download them um, and they're in Stata and R too. So, um, there are resources, and there are other resources, okay? Uh, these are not the only ones. Um, my point is that um, in 2021, doing RDD doesn't, re doesn't require you to code anything, okay? Questions? We made it to the last part of today's class, which is going to be about matching. So here, I want you to change gears, okay? Um, What's different, what's the same? Well, it's just the same is that, again, we're trying to say stuff about Y ones and Y zeros, okay? And that's the same in a lot of settings, okay? But here, we're not gonna rely on discontinuity or anything like that. We're just gonna use an assumption that, you know, in many settings, it's really hard to believe, but let's say in some settings, it actually may be valid, and so we're, and, and it's definitely popular, um, we're going to go over it. Suppose that we observe outcomes, Y, treatments, these, and some covariates, now X, okay? Notation hasn't changed the same. X are covariates, Y, D. There's no Z here because we're not going to have a discontinuity, a running variable. The main assumption, which is called selection and observables or unconfoundness, is that conditional on X, D is independent of the potential outcomes. So notice what this is saying. Conditional on enough things that you get to observe the excess, then you have a setting that is like a randomized control experiment. The treatment is independent of the potential outcomes. So sometimes called conditional independence as I wrote here. And so if this is the case and you believe this assumption, then the idea is that you should find a match of a unit in the treatment group with a unit in the control group with the same value of X. And if you do that, then you just can compare those that are treated with those that are untreated with the same value of X. So unconfoundness identifies the conditional average treatment effect. You see here the perspective of Y1 minus Y0 condition on X. This is the conditional average treatment effect is equal to this because, you know, just split the expectation. And then in this case, you, D is independent of Y. So we condition on D1 and D0. And then when D is equal to one, Y1 is actually Y. And when D is equal to zero, Y is equal to Y0. So you have this object. And this object depends on all variables that we get to observe. Okay, this is the, on the other side, we have the object that we want, which depends on variables that we do not observe, the potential outcomes. But this depends on variables that we get to observe. Now, of course, you can integrate over X and you have the average treatment effect. So if you have the conditional average treatment effect, you integrate over X, law of iterative expectations, you have the average treatment effect. So the idea of matching then is to do this trick. 
Suppose that X is only gender. And you're telling me conditional on gender, the treatment is independent of the potential outcomes. All this is saying is then suppose that gender here is only males and females, then you um, run uh, a regression or just two comparisons of means for males, you do the same for females. And then you have the conditional average treatment effects for males and females, and those are well identified by this assumption. So the idea is that for subgroups of agents with the same X, there are no unobservable differences between the treatment and the control groups. Again, conditional on this axis, you're in a randomized control experiment type of situation. And using the matching approach that identifies the conditional average treatment effect, which sometimes is denoted as K. So to be able to match, okay, this is a new assumption. You need something called overlap. What does overlap mean? Overlap means that for every X, you will have individuals in the treatment and in the control group. Okay, so go back to the gender example. If you condition males, then you need to have males that are treated and males that are untreated. Okay, condition females. You need to have females that are treated females that are entered so that you can compare them. And so that means overlap, it means condition on X, the probability that D is equal to one is not one and not zero. So this overlap assumption ends up being a complication and eventually a limitation of this approach when X is continuously distributed or where X is, you know, includes many covariates, okay? You're now having like income, gender, race, and you know, age, and you have other things. And then you can see condition on some of these subgroups. And now the subgroups are like really small. You're comparing people that make, you know, $50,000 a year, that are males, that are age 23 years old, that, you know, are Hispanic. And so now you need that in that group, to have people that are treated and untreated. And sometimes it doesn't happen. You just narrow down enough that you have everybody treated, everybody's untreated, and then you don't have overlap. So let's compare overlap with RDD. Overlap in RDD never happens. Because in RDD, when you're to the left of C, nobody's treated. And when you're to the right of C, you know, uh, everybody is treated, okay? So, uh, you know, this is a different setting. As I said, it's not RDD and it relies on different tricks. So for example, one that by construction will never happen in RDD, which is overlap. And then unconfoundness in RDD always holds because if you, instead of conditioning on X, you condition on Z, right? Well, condition on Z, D is deterministic. Remember D was the indicator that Z is greater than or equal to something. So condition on Z, D is deterministic. Of course, conditioning on Z gives you trivially that the treatment is independent of potential outcomes. Okay, so quite a different setup. So we're gonna, how do you mechanically do this matching thing? We're gonna suppose now, let's get more real. Suppose that X, as I mentioned, K, and then it has some variables that are continuous, distributed, okay? Think about, you know, when I say continuously distributed, I mean things like income, okay? Which, you know, you may discuss or argue how continuous there are. You can think about discrete random variables that have many points of support, okay, as well. So the event here, x equal to little x, has measure zero, okay? So the previous strategy that I described simply doesn't work. So we have to do something else. So the idea is to match the x's that are close according to some matching metric, okay, some distance. And so one popular one in this literature is the Mahalanavi's distance that goes as follows. Um, Define mij, um, sorry, as the distance between xi and xj defined by this quadratic form. is xi minus xj prime some sigma inverse, which is given by the variance of x, uh, xi minus xj, okay? Then we're gonna define the q closest to xi, you know, this is similar to Q needers neighbor type of approach that we discussed before. If, you know, 
um we're gonna just grab um um the q observations that are closest to i according to this metric which you can define like this then you can use other metrics for example euclidean okay in this case going to be like this or the diagonal version of the Mahalanobi distance when you just take the diagonal of sigma of course they are going to have different implications of what's close and what's uh far but uh, we're not going to discuss that the point that i care about is that one we have a notion of distance that I'm one of the, the nobodies M. And two, that given our notions of distance, we can uh, find for each observation, each I, Q observations that are close. Okay? So are we good with this setting? It's just, we have a notion of distance, and then uh, we can find observations that are close to that. That's all we're doing. So then, the trick is as follows. For a fixed value of Q, so, you know, let Q be fixed, we're going to define this J, Q, I to be the index, okay? The indices. So it's like, who is who here? That solves the following. Two things. One, here. You are going to look at people that have the opposing treatment to the unit that you care about. So you need that, you know, DJs are one minus DI. So if this person is treated, so this is a one, then you're going to look for people that are untreated. And if this person is untreated, so this is a zero, you're just going to look at people that are treated. Okay. You want people on the, with the other treatment, opposing treatment. And two, you want those that are close to I in terms of our metric. So now you're going to define the Q closest on the other side. You're going to grab an individual. You grab me. You're going to find the people, if I'm treated, the Q individuals that are closest to me that are not treated. And if I was not treated, you're going to find the Q individuals closest to me that are treated. Okay? So JQI is the index of the units in, that are in the Q closest to units I in terms of the covariance values among the units with the treatment opposite to that of unit i. So if we define j, i, k, the set of indices of this first q match it for um, each unit, okay, then the matching estimator goes as follows. Notice that we have the average of y1 minus y0, but we have hats here. So what are these hats? Well, y hat d is just yi, the observed y, if this individual is assigned to treatment d. So if you just look at the y hat 1, well, your best estimate of y hat 1 is just y if you are treated, okay? But if you are untreated, okay, then your best, or or the other way, if, if yeah, if, if you want, uh, if you're somebody who's treated, but you want the y hat 0, what's the best estimator is the average of those cues that are close to you. Okay. So to repeat, for each individual, you're going to grab their outcome and you're going to see if that individual was treated or untreated. You just put that as a Y1 or a Y0. And then the other one that you don't get to observe, the counterfactual, just going to be the average of the Q that are closest on the other side. And that's a matching estimator. Do you have any questions about this before I tell you the properties? Mechanically, it should be simple to understand, I hope. So, this is a type of nearest neighbor estimator. We discussed that. It's not the same, but quietly related. As key in Q increases, the variance goes down, but the bias goes up. So again, Q here is going to be a tuning parameter. So this paper by Abadi and Imbens, 2006, and Econometrica, who study the asymptotic properties of our matching estimator of the average treatment effect with a fixed number of matches as the sample size goes to infinity. And there are a couple of interesting results that I'm summarizing here. First one, this estimator is consistent as n goes to infinity for a fixed number Q. Okay, so it works. The bias 
is of order O to the N to the negative one KC. What's KC? KC is the dimension of the continuous covariates in X. Take my example. Suppose you have in income, gender, race, and age. Then, you know, you may assume age could be tricky, but assuming that, that um, you have a lot of individual for every uh, age, the continuous covariates would be income. So KC would be one, even though you have you know four covariates. KC is out of your covariates, the dimension of those that are continuous. So the rate of convergence of this estimator is of order um, one over N, uh, sorry, the variance is of order one over N. However, the, the bias of this estimator has um, three properties. The square root N times the bias goes to zero, a constant or infinity. If you have one continuous covariate, then you obtain zero. Two continuous covariates, you obtain a bias. Or more than two, it explodes to infinity. So if you have more than two continuous covariates, the estimator is not even root n asymptotically normal. Then there are things that are about related to efficiency and the bootstrap validity and subsampling. So I want to clarify something. So far in this class, we haven't talked about bootstrap. We haven't talked about subsampling. Okay, so statements like this for you, if you haven't been exposed to these resampling methods, mean nothing. However, we are going to cover bootstrap as subsampling later. So eventually, when you wrap up everything we're going to cover in this class, these things are going to make sense. So for now, the only thing that you need to know is that these estimators, matching estimators, could be tricky when it comes to inference because, you know, they may not be asymptotically normal. The bootstrap in general fails, okay? And then subsampling, which is another alternative that we're going to learn, uh, uh, works, but it requires k less than or equal than 2, okay? So we're seeing the a limitation of matching estimators uh, come when the dimension of continuous covariates is... is uh, large, or at least greater than two. So, given that, you know, you have many X's, uh, there was a quite an influential paper that proposed an alternative way to match, and that's called propensity score matching. So here we're going to define something called the propensity score, which is the probability that you're assigned to treatment conditional on your access. Okay, this is known as the propensity score. And the main result is that unconfoundedness implies this, that conditional on the propensity score, the potential outcomes are independent of the treatment. This was a very important observation because it was done by Rosenbaum and Rubin, because now instead of conditioning on all the X's, you can condition on a scalar. The propensity score is a scalar. It's a probability, so it's just a number between zero and one. And then instead of conditioning, suppose you have 10 covariates on this 10 covariates, you can condition this summary measure that is known as the propensity score. So the proof, you know, which is goes here, you just write the probability that this equals one, condition the potential outcomes and the propensity score. Well, you can use the law of iterative expectations, okay? And so this is the um, expected value of the same object where you now condition on X as well, okay? Condition on the same thing. Well, once you condition on X, okay, of course, having P here doesn't accomplish anything. So you have the same expectation. We have P and the same object here. And now look at this. Condition on X and confoundness says that D and the potential outcomes are independent. So this expectation is just the expected value of the condition on P. Well, the expected value of the condition on P is the propensity score. And the expected value of the propensity score conditional on the propensity score is the propensity score. In other words, condition on the propensity score, D is independent of the potential outcomes. So we prove that this over here holds very clean and simple result that leads to uh, powerful implications.
So then the idea is that instead of matching on the x's, you can match on the propensity score. The result by Rosenbaum and Rubin implies that this average treatment effect can be written like this, where instead of conditioning on the x's, you just condition on the propensity score. So you can use matching estimator, matching on the propensity score. Just go back to what we said. You don't need to use like a quadratic, whatever. It's just now scalar. You do the same, exactly what we did before with propensity scores as matching, you obtain a matching estimator. However, another cool feature of this is that you can, instead of doing matching, you can reformulate the problem by noticing the following. Respective value of D times uh, Y divided by the propensity score. Assume that the propensity score for now is known, okay? So we have D, Y, and the propensity score. We observe all this. We observe D, Y, and X. Well, law of iterative expectations, this is one over the propensity score, expected value of D times Y1, okay? Because, you know, D is equal to one. Um, when D is equal to one, Y is equal to Y1. And then, you know, condition on the propensity score, these two are independent, so you can split them in two parts. And then you realize the expected value of D given the propensity score is just the propensity score. So these two things here cancel. And this is respective value of y1. You can do the same. You identify the value of y0, okay? And so you put these things together, and then essentially you're saying respective value of dy divided by the propensity score minus this guy, respective value of 1 minus d y divided by one minus the propensity score identifies the average treatment effect, which you can rewrite as in the first expression. So how do you estimate this? Well, just replace the expectation with an average. You're done. And here you have an estimator that uses unconfoundness, but it doesn't match. It just weights individuals by the propensity score. So this is often called propensity score weighting. Okay. And it just uses the simple derivations in this line. It's a different estimator that propensity score matching. Uh, numerically, they're going to be different. They just use different identification arguments. Um, you know, depending on the setting, they could be quite close. So, propensity score is a scalar, as I said. And Avadi and Inman's imply that the bias term is of lower order than the variance term. Um, and that matching leads to root n consistent and asymptotically normal estimator. Because we're in a case where like this kc, if you want before, is just one. So we are cool. And so the problem is that the propensity score is an unknown function. Okay, so what people do is you, in the first step, you estimate the propensity score essentially by uh, estimating the probability that D is equal to one conditional on X, okay? And then notice that this is the expected value of D conditional on X. So for example, you could use some of the tools that we learned last class, but you could also use some of the tools that we're gonna learn next week, okay? But it's just the condition expectation of D given X. And then estimators based on the true propensity score have the same asymptotic variance as those based uh, on the estimated propensity score. Uh, sorry, I said something wrong here. So the estimator based on the true propensity score have the same asymptotic variance as that in um, a body and immense. But when you estimate the propensity score, uh, you run into something called generated regressor, okay? Because it's, you can view this as you run a regression instead of like Y or D on, uh, Y, sorry, on the propensity score P of X, you're running Y on an estimated propensity score P hat of X, okay? And, you know, that has been fully worked out. It's beyond the scope of this class. But for example, in this paper, the asymptotic variance of semi-parametric estimators with generated regressors. And there are other papers, one also important in the annals of statistics. Um, so the idea is, you know, you're going to do this in two steps. In the first step, you're going to estimate the propensity score. This is gonna give you p hat 
of x. You can do this non-parametrically sometimes. People here, oftentimes, if x has many components, will go for a parametric approach, like a logit regression. And again, we're going to talk about logit regression in a couple of weeks. Some uh, more modern approaches sometimes involve some machine learning tools, and people will estimate this using a uh, random forest or some uh, neural nets or something like that. It doesn't matter. It's an estimator of the propensity score. And then after that, you use, uh, you know, the estimator theta hat ATE with P hat X. And this could be a matching estimator or a weighted on the propensity score estimator. You go to the formula in the previous slide and you just replace P with P hat everywhere. And as I said, the issues in these papers, for example, over here are way beyond the scope of this class, but um, it's something that is so popular that if you start reading and uh, inquiring about it, you're gonna quickly learn uh, how to deal with these um, issues. So um, here, as opposed to other lectures, I included some papers, uh, the references, so that if you're interested in uh, taking a look at any of this, um, you know where, where to start, okay? But um, other than that, we reach the end of today's class. So um, I'm gonna answer some questions now, and then uh, after that, I'm gonna see you next week. Yeah.